16th edition of the Jaipur Literature Festival 2023, protected by that all, Banega Swast India. We are delighted to introduce our next session, The Great Game of Tech Morality. As the marvels of technological advancement across the world are faced with a series of crises, a celebrated panel comes together to examine the morality and ethical underpinnings of human dependence on machines and AI. In conversation with journalist Praveen Swami, they discuss the paradox of the benefits of tech and AI in the face of unequal access, digital upheaval, and changing geopolitical and economic systems. Our first speaker today is Mr. Toby Walsh, a professor of AI at the University of New South Wales, Sydney. He's a strong advocate of limits to ensure AI is used to improve our lives and a fellow of the Australia Academy of Science as well. He was named on the international who's who in AI list of influencers and his most recent work is Machines Behaving Badly, the Morality of AI. Our spec second speaker today is Mr. Avinash Pandey, Chief Executive Officer of ABP Network and serving President of the News Broadcasters and Digital Association and the President of the International Advertising Association India Chapter. He has been a member of several committees, including the Media and Entertainment Committee of FICI, Chairmanship of the National Council on Entertainment and Media, Asochum, and the Committee of Experts appointed by the INB Ministry on Ethical Standards in Media Coverage. Under his leadership, the ABP News Channel won the most popular Hindi New Channel Award at the ITA Awards in 2022. Our third speaker today is Mr. Anirudh Suri. His critically acclaimed book, The Great Tech Game, provides a big picture view on this vital question of our times. He continues to explore India's place in this new world order through his work as a technology venture capitalist and a non-resident scholar at Carnegie India. Our moderator today is Mr. Praveen Swami, a national security editor at The Print and a New Delhi-based digital platform. An award-winning journalist, he is the author of two books on the Kashmir conflict. Ladies and gentlemen, the great game of tech morality. Toby Walsh, Abhinash Pandey, and Anirudh Suri in conversation with Mr. Praveen Swami. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you all for coming out on a Saturday morning. Um, when, when we started considering this session, the smart guys on my right uh, planned everything in great care so we could explain and unpack this incredibly complicated technical conversation uh, on the future of AI. Uh, and they picked me to moderate it since I know absolutely nothing about this. Uh, this is to make themselves look even smarter and more distinguished than they are. So forgive me uh, for anything stupid I might ask or say. Uh, I just misuse my speaker's, uh, my, my uh, prerogative here for one minute to um, point you all in the direction as we contemplate this discussion of a painting from the 1920s called Angelus Novelis by uh, Paul Clay. And it is a picture of the angel of history being blown by these storm winds uh, that were of course lashing Europe during that picture. And the angel of history is unable to resist and all in her wake is a pile of detritus destroyed civilizations because it uh, like in many many ages technology has seemed incomprehensible scary with the capacity to tear apart everything that we know and make people like me look foolish potentially redundant uh, in the jobs we do uh, but the history of the 20th century of course was not one exclusively of devastation uh, brought about by technology though it was that among other things i'll start with you uh, toby if i might um, the biggest concerns that seem to be emerging in this weird and wonderful world of AI is who controls the technology, what ends is it used for, and what means do we have to regulate those ends? Would that be a fair characterization of your concerns? Yes, I, I, I think it would be a very fair characterization. These are technologies that look set to transform pretty much every aspect of our lives. It's, it's hard to think of something that we do in our work or our play that won't be changed by having these smart machines around. Um, and unfortunately, it's a lot, of, a lot of people in Silicon Valley who are making the choices 
as to what changes are going to happen to our lives. And, and that's why you know, I wrote the book, um, to try and broaden the conversation, to try and help people like you to understand what's at stake here, um, and also to encourage people to, to take um, some positive action so that the, 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 the technology will touch all of our lives, all of us should be involved in the conversations. Um, because there's sometimes this mistake, people often ask me this question, well, where is this technology going to take us? What, what, what are we going to have in the future? And, and I always go back to the idea that technology is not destiny. That the future is something that we decide today. We make decisions, we make lots of choices as to how the technology is and is not allowed to enter our lives. Um, and those decisions should be made by just those people in Silicon Valley. They should be made by all of us because um, the, all of us are going to have our lives touched. So in the case of, if I may just follow up, uh, in the case of ChatGPT, which you've written about, uh, we, we, as in the public, uh, do not even know how this works uh, and, and what might be going on and therefore have no power to influence the choices it's making for us. Would that be correct? Yeah, I'm not sure you have to know how the technology works to be able to have a say in how it's used. And there's that wonderful quotation from Arthur C. Clarke, any sufficiently advanced technology looks like magic. And, and AI is increasingly uh, looking like magic. Th that, I'm not sure, is particularly helpful. But we can all see the uh, implications, the applications of that magic uh, without having to understand, um, maybe as well as I or my colleagues do, exactly what is behind the scene. But the, the fact that we have a technology that can write very convincing synthetic text that can be used for benefit I um, mean you know as soon as I showed chat GPT to my wife she wrote she wrote a business letter with it she wrote a letter of complaint to Fitbit to replace her broken Fitbit um, I'll report back in a few days whether that was successful but it was a pretty good letter so that's you know whoever liked writing a letter of complaint um, well some people might but most of us don't most of us is not a not an activity we would choose to do unless we had to. So very good applications. Equally, same technology can be used by mischievous people to flood social media with conspiracy theories, untruths, to send out phishing emails. Um, there's lots of ways the same technology can be used. And that, that's the core fundamental problem with AI. It's a dual-use technology. There are plentiful good uses of the technology and there are plentiful bad uses of the technology. Uh, and we want to somehow ensure we get most of the positives with as few of the negatives as possible. Right, so a truly terrifying world where Donald Trump wouldn't even have to exercise his thumbs in order to start tweeting. <laughs> it would happen by itself. But uh, from your corner watching over uh, media um, and looking at the impacts AI is going to have, we have more and more newsrooms today experimenting with auto-translation or automatic content generation systems. Uh, we have some across the world that are actually inventing television anchors uh, who look like their audience uh, s seem to want them to look like. Uh, are, are, we, are we at least in this media space ended in, uh, end, headed into a world where the distinction between uh, the human being uh, and, and imagination ceases to exist, and where information will be produced by algorithms. See, you don't have to go that far for the algorithm. I can tell you today, everybody and, uh, and thousands of youths who are here are already tweeting and writing about what's happening here. So the democratization of content had already happened. It has gone beyond the power of us who thinks that we have a right to say what is the right thing to say. That power has been taken away from us. Machines are doing something very important and any technology, the technology role is to create time. Technology creates time, and in our newsroom, that technology is helping us write articles where, where emotions and analysis are not required. But when it comes to the human emotion, when it comes to the opinion, people like us sitting here are required to write in the newsroom, because without that, you cannot reflect a society. I mean, you know, 2010, at the Cannes Lions Festival, we were given a book which was completely written by a machine 12 years ago. Today, 
in our newsroom, there are several articles which are written by machines. People need it because in the internet, it is such a vast, vast ocean that you need to flood that with a lot of articles. And thanks to the Facebook and Google monopoly on that, you struggle to get your article noticed. But people like him or him writing something interesting, people would be interested in. That thing, I, can, I think, can never be taken away by technology. And that's the future of journalism, business, or technology. Technology will do what human beings should not waste their time on. So I, I just. But that raises the question whether you're, since the computers are saving you time, you can do one of two things. You can, you can give those, that, that time to, back to people to, to do other things, or you can, you can put some of those people out of work. Not necessarily. If you look at since the invent of the computer age to latest uh, uh, editing technology of machines where used to use tape, now we are editing through our mobile phone, the number of people editing the videos have gone up. Technology is creating time to do you th do more things what you can do in 18 or 20 hours of a day that, that at best that you work. More and more people are working today more number of hours than they were working about 100 years ago. So journalism, book writing, uh, reporting, making video films. I think technology is only an enabler and not a destroyer. AI, I can tell you, doing lots of things. And as Google translations and things that we see, today Google is launching a technology that I'm speaking in English and somebody can listen to me in Bhojpuri. It is possible today. But will that reflect the same emotion? No. And I think that's where the space is for the human being vis-a-vis -vis the AI technology. So, Anirudh, I know we touched on some of these questions in our last discussion on your fantastic book. And, uh, but, but I want to draw out some of this uh, business. So, yes, we were told that we, technology will give us more time. Um, there are a bunch of disturbing studies over the last 20 years now showing that for the first time since IQ tests began to be widely used early in the last century, uh, that there's been a dipping off of scores among young people on standardized tests. Very hard to explain, but one of the reasons for that seems to be that certain kinds of cognitive learning that ought to have been taking place among young people is being displaced by staring at screens. In the spare time, we have staring at screens. Uh, all sorts of other, uh, you know, potentially negative outfits. Uh, outcomes, excuse me, as societies, uh, are we discussing these technologies enough in order to be used to use them in ways that are meaningful to us as human societies, or are we letting ourselves be driven like cattle by the technology itself? Yeah, no. So I think, unfortunately, um, the the latter is more true, right? We are allowing technology to shape our values the way we spend our time, the way we utilize our existing skills, too much. And you know, even in my book, uh, Praveen, I've argued this, that we cannot allow technology's uh, relationship with us as humans to be a one-way street. We cannot end up in a place where technology, the way it might be designed by, I think as Toby was saying, in Silicon Valley or in Bangalore or wherever it's getting designed at the first point, we cannot allow that to shape our values in a unidirectional way. Rather, we must make sure that this becomes a two-way street. Our values, and that's why I argue for a values-first approach, the values that we as humans hold dear, whether it's creativity, whether it's privacy, right? Whether it's good utilization of time, whatever it is that we as society hold dear, those values must start to shape the design of technology when the technology is getting designed, right? Um, so I'll draw a very simple analog to um, uh, AI, right? So AI is considered to be what people in the field call it a general purpose technology, a GPT, which will have applications in various sectors. Um, if you look back, you can consider electricity to be a GPT. You can even consider the internet today to be a general purpose technology. And the analogy I want to draw for everyone here is if you go back to the early days of the internet, were we having enough conversations about what we want the internet to look like, what we want its design to look like, what kind of values we want it to adhere to? No. As a result, today, we are now struggling with apps that are causing addiction. 
that are causing that low IQ uh, dip that you're talking about. And I think that goes back, brings back the idea that as we think about designing AI and the applications of AI, which right now, as Toby and I were discussing backstage, suddenly we are seeing this big jump in interest and et cetera, even though I know Toby is involved in it for decades, but as the masses or a larger group of us start to get involved in the applications of AI, it's very important for us to think about the design principles that will underlie the applications of AI and what values we want those applications to adhere to. Otherwise, it's highly likely that this dipping of scores, right, this destruction of our creative potential could continue, right? Now, that's the pessimistic view. I also agree with Avinash to a large extent also, where I believe that technology is also, while IQ scores might be dipping, there's a certain level of creativity that technology is also helping unleash. To his point about Twitter or, or technology putting, being put in the hands of all of us is allowing the creation of this, what is called the creative economy. Where now if you go to Instagram, while for some people it's a waste of time, but for some people now it's become an absolutely amazing avenue to express their creativity, either in design or in apparel or content creation, in anything, right? So there's always those two sides for us to keep in mind. Which is why, as I was listening to both my fellow panelists, I was almost thinking about a characterization I make in my book. A question that was posed to me when I was writing the book was, am I a tech pessimist or am I a tech optimist, right? And, and, and as you listen to Toby, you might even, and I'm going to be a bit provocative here, you might even think that Toby is a tech pessimist, right? Because he's so worried about the control and uh, who will control and how much inequality of wealth might get created. And then you listen to Avinash and he's clearly a tech optimist saying that, no, 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 jobs are not going to get lost. In fact, we'll create more jobs. I put myself in the bucket between the two, which is of tech realists, that unless we are much more careful about how we think about designing technology, using it and regulating it, we'll end up in one of these two buckets, which I think will not be necessarily very good. Toby, I want to draw you out, if I may, for a second. As a as a person who thinks about the way technology has evolved, from the origins of the Industrial Revolution to even earlier, small groups of oligarchs and elites have more or less imposed technologies on society. Nobody asked uh, industrial workers if they wanted the railway locomotive. Nobody asked Lancashire mill workers if they wanted uh, increasingly sophisticated and larger mills. Um, what means might there be for civil society to impose the kinds of regulation and conversation with tech companies that you are talking about? No, I, I think that's a great place to look, to say, um, we could learn from history. This is not the first technological revolution that will change the way we do work, change many aspects of our lives. Uh, and the Industrial Revolution, I think, is a good example because we did come out of the Industrial Revolution with um, most people starting to live better quality lives. Um, 50 years into the Industrial Revolution, uh, we saw life expectancy starting to improve. Um, we, we've seen, even, you know, even in a developed country like the United Kingdom, life expectancy has doubled since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Um, median income adjusted for inflation, adjusted for value, has increased uh, spectacularly since then. So uh, not just the owners of production, but the workers have benefited greatly. But it's also worth remembering from that history lesson that the, that took 50 years of pain. For most workers, life went backwards for the first 50 years. We went through some pretty turbulent, difficult times, the Great Depression, the Great Strike, uh, of course, two world wars as well. And it was only after that that we saw change, change driven in large part by those workers, by the development of the uh, union labor system, uh, development of, of, of labor laws, child labor laws, uh, the welfare state. Um, there were lots of changes put in to the way our institutions worked to spread the benefit around. It didn't happen by chance. And indeed, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, we saw things go backwards for many people. Um, and I think we're in an equally difficult, challenging time. And the answers will be equally radical. People are starting now to consider a four-day week. Uh, why is it that we, the, you know, why do we have the weekend? People forget the weekend was an invention 
of the Industrial Revolution. There's nothing in the, the, the Earth going around the Sun that demands um, two days off every seven. There's, there's nothing in physics. That's a human institution, and it began with the workers in the northeast of England rising up and saying, well, now we're producing more and you're getting wealthier. We want Sunday off to go to church. And then things got even wealthier and they said, we want Saturday afternoon off to rest. And then the whole of Saturday. And then for some strange reason, I've never, never seen a good explanation for this, we stopped. Why did we decide that two days was just enough? Um, and Good, good, good. Uh, uh, and interestingly now, now, they're trying experiments in many countries. There's a, there's a huge, great experiment going on in Europe. Uh, there's experiments in New Zealand and elsewhere, looking at what happens to if, if you give people four days off every week. So that's three days off every week, work just four days. And they discover two remarkable facts. The first is that people are just as productive, which means you can pay them just as much. They do as much in the four days as they previously did in, in all five days. You stop having those bullshit meetings and you get focused on what you need to do. And secondly, and now who would have imagined this? People are happier. They spend more time with their families, in their communities, doing art, coming to book fairs, festivals. Um, that's something we could demand. If, we, if the machines are taking some of the sweat, we could take this opportunity to push back and say, OK, let's make sure the billionaires don't become trillionaires. Let's make sure all of us share some of those benefits. I'm just going to sound you out on that, Avinash, but a little anecdote. Uh, since I, I sense many supporters of a four-day working week here, uh, the Lancashire mill workers Toby was talking about actually invented a saint called Saint Monday, who had said that the workers of Lancashire uh, could have Monday off as well to worship Saint Monday to recover from their Sunday hangovers. Uh, I'm not that I'm advocating this, I'm just throwing it out there. Uh, from the point of view of running a business, is this vision of a flattened, more democratic workplace something that is doable, something that is the consequence of new technology? Uh, or is the technological disruption not of an order where relationships between workers and employers have to fundamentally change? This is the tool to enhance productivity. So first of all, Toby, I hope uh, Elon Musk was listening to you just now, <laughs> what you just said. But uh, see, uh, for, for running any business, you require the best technology that is available in the world at that point of time. That does not mean that the role and responsibilities of people changes. What it has done smartly that probably today, the gap at my time when I, and when I began my career, that what I knew and what my CEO knew was such a large gap. Today it is not so, right? But that's create a creative advantage. Rather than having an, uh, thinking that, look, if my guys knows too much, I can't control the farm. No, that's not true. In fact, my work becomes easier. I can drive more uh, uh, contribution to the work than what I could have done otherwise. Second thing what he just said has also done is that people are free today to work from anywhere. But that has also intruded into your personal time. There is a very cliche called work-life balance. There is nothing called work-life balance. It, it says that the work is not life. Today on a Saturday, if so many people are sitting here listening, maybe it's part of their work, maybe it's part of their leisure. People do what they enjoy. What technology has smartly done is that you can do your work at your enjoyable pace and time. And that's how we look at, and that's how as a corporation we look at that uh, what value that you add to people's life when they come to work. Technology also has a third dimension. Okay, which is what he almost mentioned but stayed away from there, is that it is creating almost absolutist uh, tendency of absolutist government. Everybody is scared about technology, you know, as if what is going to do, we won't be able to control it, about AI and all that. I don't think so. We are a very preliminary stage of AI. We don't know what is going to happen in next five years or four years' time. As I said 12 years back, a machine wrote the book. Today, a machine is creating a film. And there are, there are anchors being, we are giving presentation that you don't need an anchor. I was given a presentation by a leading ad agency saying that you do need a presenter. There is an AI bot which will present the news the way people want to see it. But that does not mean that jobs will go away or people emotions will go away. And I think these things are very at a very elementary stage. Look at what happens with metaverse, 
just now, you know. So I think we are in a very early stage of discovering what's going to be interesting next time. Part of the challenge is the unintended consequences. That there are, we're running these very big experiments and the technology is accelerating. We've, we've not invented technologies in the past where you can so easily touch a billion people. I mean, if you look at the Industrial Revolution, it took a long time for the Industrial Revolution to happen and to spread out uh, around the world. You had to, you know, the, not, the ideas had to, had to travel slowly uh, back then over, over the course of years. You had to build expensive steam engines and um, manufacturing plants. Now you can have an idea and, and tomorrow it can be in the hands of millions or billions of people. Um, and the problem with that is that even, even small consequences can have outsized impact when they're multiplied by a billion. I, and this is what I wanted to come to because workplaces, uh, finishing an exam paper while hungover and not having studied for it at all, these are good positive outcomes of the technology. Um, but there's some dystopian sides to it, which we discussed when we had that Ukraine war con uh, conversation. We're on the cusp right now of artificial intelligence guiding warfare, yeah, right, guiding right. decisions to take life. Uh, there are people who argue that that will be that, that a machine, an algorithm which can make that decision might actually be better than a human being who is panicked and scared and, and uh, prone to all kinds of error. Uh, but at least I find it terrifying uh, that an uh, algorithm will decide in a battlefield of the future uh, whether the town of Jaipur is to be leveled or not. Wh where, is, where is this particular sort of less nice side of things taking us? You know, so I think as Toby mentioned, right, AI, much like many other technologies that have been transformative in recent decades or centuries, is a dual-use technology. It can be used for civilian purposes to help you do better reporting, or better content creation, but at the same time, it's often being used by advanced militaries to create cutting-edge systems that either can take quicker decisions, more precise decisions, etc. We all know that drones have now been used extensively in various wars. Um, artificial intelligence-driven manned systems um, are already being used, and to the extent that it relies on decisions being taken by humans, you can say that it's just a tool. But at some point, like I actually, just now at uh, breakfast, uh, I was sitting with someone and uh, they said a very interesting point. They said, you know, they find it very ironical when we are at a com on a computer and it says, why don't you identify five photos in this set of photos to make sure you are not a robot. And the irony of a computer asking you whether you are <laughs> a robot, right? Um, I, I thought that was brilliant. Um, and I think it comes back to this point where the, the, the distinction between AI-driven decisions, whether in military purposes or otherwise, and human decisions is gonna get extremely blurred. And that's what, for example, Yuval Harari has spoken about, that at what point do we know us better? And at what point does artificial intelligence or big data start to know us much better than we know ourselves? I think these are the questions we have to like ask because eventually geopolitical battles, wars, if you look at the trend, they're becoming more and more tech driven, right? There's talk about using genetic editing to create um, soldiers who are much more enhanced, right? So there's talk about, for example, in countries even that happen to be our neighbors of creating soldiers who will be genetically enhanced using CRISPR and other technologies who can be better equipped to deal with wars in the mountain areas, right? So I think the military implications of these technologies are often less talked about, but actually end up being very consequential when it comes to geopolitical battles that we know, if you look at colonialism and various other historical examples, ultimately these geopolitical battles dictate our lives indirectly a lot more because the values of the victor in these geopolitical battles that ends up shaping our lives also. So I think equally important to be thinking about the military implications of AI. So, Toby, I'm going to be a bit, uh, uh, if, you, if you like, meta and uh, about my next question. When, when we talk about artificial intelligence, uh, a few years ago, or we, as undergraduates all had the Turing test and it seemed incredibly simple to distinguish uh, when uh, a, a computer system would become intelligent. 
uh, I leave it to you to explain the test, but are we discussing genuine intelligence uh, to the point where moral and philosophical quandaries and conflicts of the kinds humans engage with, uh, is the technology uh, going to or headed in a direction that it might at some stage be able to replicate those infinitely complex negotiations the human mind engages in? So, so the Turing test is named after Alan Turing, who is uh, one of the fathers of the computer. He was working in Bletchley Park where they invented um, some of the fir first computers used for code breaking and during the Second World War. Uh, and also he's the father of artificial intelligence. He wrote the, what is generally considered to be the first paper about artificial intelligence, realizing that the machines that he and his colleagues have been building in Bletchley Park and, and later in Manchester and elsewhere uh, could be used to, to make intelligent decisions, could be used to play chess and, and do other things that we consider to be intelligent. And, and he asked the question, well, how will we know when we succeeded? When will we have artificial intelligence? And he said, well, that's a bit of a difficult question to answer because we don't have a very good definition of intelligence. It's not what, what an IQ test is. That just measures your ability to do IQ tests. There's lots of cultural and other biases in IQ tests. So he said, well, let's frame it in this way. Let's just a very, a very functional uh, definition, which is when a computer can persuade you it's human, can pass for a human. You can't tell the computer apart from uh, the human by ask, ans asking it questions, then you might as well say it's intelligent. Um, and that's now being called the, the Turing test. Uh, it's more a, what we call, I think, a Gedanken, a thought experiment, a philosophical metaphor for us to understand what's going on here. Um, I think the, the fundamental problem, though, is to think that there's one type of intelligence. There isn't one type of intelligence. Um, there are many types of intelligence on the planet. Um, your family dog has a certain amount of intelligence. Uh, the octopus uh, has a very different type of intelligence. It's considered to be a, the smartest invertebrate. It's the only animal invertebrate uh, protected by um, European law against animal experimentation. Um, but yet, it's, it has a very different physiology than, uh, than us. It's 60% uh, of its brain is in its legs. It's a very distributed form of intelligence. Um, and it must be very different, I imagine, to be an octopus than it is to be a human. And uh, so that shows us that intelligence could evolve in different ways. And so to think the intelligence of machines is going to be the same as the intelligence of humans, I think is a fundamental natural human flaw. Right? Your, your, your experience of being intelligent, when you open your eyes this morning, you woke up and started to think, that clouds your idea of what intelligence naturally is. But it's worth thinking that there will be very other types of intelligence. And this, the limited intelligence we can build in machines has a very different flavor, it seems, already than human intelligence. And I always think that we should ultimately think of AI perhaps as alien intelligence. We should treat it with the same way that we treat octopuses. I mean, no. And equally, we do, wouldn't ever uh, allow octopuses onto the battlefield to kill humans and equip them with you know, artillery shells and, and high explosives to do more damage. We wouldn't trust them to do that. So I'm not sure we should trust uh, machines, computing machines. I, I, I'm not sure that. we can ever trust human beings not to use animals for those purposes when they're given a chance. So I'm thinking from the Battle of Megara in classical Greece, uh, elephants and that, pigs. That, so that's true, but we, but we have now actually made that unlawful. So international humanitarian law requires um, you to uh, various principles like proportionality, your, your military response can be only proportional to the threat, distinction, you have to only target combatants, not civilians. Uh, if someone puts their hands up and surrenders, you have to accept their surrender not, and stop trying to kill them at that point. If they're lying wounded on the battlefield, you're again not allowed to target them. So all of those things are really important principles that has made war a little less barbaric than it is. And those are all things that trouble you when you start to hand over the killing to, to um, other animals or uh, to artificial intelligence. Do you agree with that perception, Avinash, that we might be with our uh, newsroom translation algorithms and our uh, pretty anchors, sort of participating in taking the world down a road that 
we might end up regretting? See, I don't think so. anybody should be worried here about television or verified news media or news networks like ours or many others in this country. What we should worry about that what AI is doing, what E is equal to MC square did to Second World War, right? A, a, a formula which was designed originally to create energy was used in the wrong direction of making atomic bomb and today the world has so many atomic bombs that it can destroy the world many thousand times. Social media today is the biggest problem. Just to give you an example, 2014 US elections, everybody talked about Facebook uh, uh, was used by Russians to manipulate this and how did they do it? They persuasively pursued all whites in America until the day of the voting that please go out and vote, otherwise America will no, more, no longer be white. And this did the same thing with the black population saying that, what's the point of voting? Nothing is going to change for you. Don't go out and vote today. And it changed the election. What, what social media through these AIs are doing is the most dangerous thing to have, creating fake news, creating uh, cultural animosity, uh, religious animosity, and bringing the world to the brink of the walk. I think the regulators, uh, technology companies, and media organizations should work together to solve that problem, rather than trying to control the, what AI can do in future. AI is today solving medical issues. Engineers are becoming doctors, right? Authors are becoming far more smarter as to what kind of content should I write to, to address to a particular audience, right? I don't know, I don't know about that. <laughs> so, so, you know, it, it all, it's all up to you. What's so I'm going to jump on you a little bit there, and I know this is a contentious terrain you would actually welcome more government and regulator intervention uh, on social media platforms to tell them what they can do and not do, or should this be something that media and AI platforms do by themselves? See, uh, see, all power comes with responsibility. I think the technology company has to feel responsible that they must have technology in place to separate what is fiction versus fact. And if they don't do it, regulators globally will come and ask them to do it. It's but better they do it themselves. By, by the way, I think it's equally important, and I will say in this in the case of India, it's equally important that that kind of uh, judgment has to be imposed across all media, not just social media. Um, because I think if you look at even television today, Avinash, I'm sorry to say that I don't think that we have any kind of real checks on what we are listening, whether that's actually fact-checked, whether the opinions that are being passed off as news, whether they're actually news or not. So I make this point not to, not to say anything about TV as a particular medium, but I make this a point that we have to separate in social media two things. One is the advertising aspect of it, which is, I think, where the problems around the elections really began, which what you were referring to. And then I think what we have to make sure does not get over-regulated, Praveen, is the idea that all of us, can express our views freely. I think to me that there is nothing better than social media when it comes to expression of our views um, that has been enabled by social media in a democracy, right? But it is not now the domain of just a few. So we have to make sure that we don't hit social media with a big hammer, right? And only social media with a big hammer. So we have 10 minutes left and I'll take questions. Uh, the gentleman there in the first row, second row, Right there, um, and then we can just pass it back along to the next two. Hello. Um, hi, thank you for a wonderful talk. I just wanted to ask, you talked a bit about dividing fact from fiction in the age of AI. Um, I was wondering if you could comment on the increasing kind of precariousness of evidence, both kind of with the rise of deep fakes, for example, but also with the rise of AI art. Um, say, for example, historical evidence. I've seen a lot on social media recently, there was a thing that went round of a Mughal miniature where, you know, Shah Jahan was being offered a, a pizza that had basically been generated by AI. And of course, this was being passed around on social media as historical evidence. And what I find interesting is at what point, both in the kind of criminal aspect as well as, you know, how does AI affect evidence? <laughs> uh, I mean... I, I'll, I'll share a couple of quick points. See, it goes back to the concept of, let's say, Wikipedia, right? Wikipedia, if you just go back 20 years ago, is considered to be this thing where anyone can come and put any fact, right? But at the same time, think about how it's designed. It's designed in a way to allow others in the community to come and edit it 
and provide evidence, etc. Right. So I think Wikipedia, in a way, provides us an interesting model to think about when it comes to deep fakes, AI-driven content, etc. Because we have to make sure that those guardrails are there, whether it's community-driven, right, crowdsourced, or you have clear categorization that this is not real. I think there are very easy and obvious ways from other models that we can use here. It's not as new, I think, to Toby's point. Every technology seems new to us, but often the guardrails that need to be built around it, you can find analogs from previous ways in which we've created uh, guardrails. And I think that's where we need to go with this kind of AI, deep fake content, etc. We're going to have to become much more skeptical. We're going to have to, if you didn't see it with your own eyes, you have to entertain the idea it is synthetic. It's been made by a computer. And we have to ask ourselves, this is where good journalism comes in. We, um, did it come from a good journalistic source where I know they've gone to do the fact checking? I can trust that. Otherwise, you have to consider the idea that someone's trying to fool you. One quick point I'll make on this. Uh, see the technology of, of content uh, dissemination which was designed by social media was actually designed for selling advertising, right? Where it pushes you again and again Coke ads so that you buy a Coke every day. What it does is that, that it, it gets you passionate about a particular news item which may not be true. And these are the trends that are being reflected in my newsroom saying that these are the news which are trending. And what if, if the television and the newspapers start showing you the same news? The world will get destroyed. 5% of the people in the world go to college. But this technology has enabled the, all the fake news to spread to everyone who is educated, non-educated, a child. Now that's the danger point. Gentlemen back there. Thank you. I just wish to know uh, that uh, with the rise of technology, we will have new skills coming in forefront. Uh, so I was wondering if did you, uh, if the esteemed panel can comment on how India is faring uh, in setting up the training and the retraining of such skills, given the per capita India has over $2,000, unlike in the Europe and in the West, to say the least. So I, I'm just drawing a case in point, right? Like with the reusable shuttle back in California by Elon Musk, the cost of sending a use of space by rockets is one fifth. So for a nation like India, which is 1.4 billion people, how are we going to work with that? Anyone like to take that? I mean, I think there, there is no other important point than skills, right? I mean, as the nature of jobs changes because of AI and other emerging technologies, while we've been talking a lot about the dangers, it's, I think, equally or more importantly, an economic opportunity, right, for, for India and Indians. And I think to that extent, to the extent that private sector, the government and us as individuals can skill ourselves in these technologies of the future, I think it's absolutely essential if we want to leverage the economic opportunity that AI brings with it, or any other technology brings with it. But are we doing enough? Obviously not. So we have five minutes to go. I'll just take two more questions. OK. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to ask a question. My question is that uh, it's directed towards the topic of AI art. You said AI will not take away jobs. And yet, in September 2022, in a US art competition, AI art won first place. How can you say that artists won't lose their jobs when artists primarily depend on commissions for their livelihood? I, uh, I, can t I can tell you one thing, okay? No matter what AI creates, it would not be valuable in the art market. I, I think it's, it's an important question. Um, and there will be some people who make art who will be displaced by the technology. Um, if you're a graphic artist, you, people pay you to make graphic art uh, illustrations. Well, now there are very good programs, unfortunately, that do that at much less cost. Um, but equally, uh, I don't think great artists, be they poets, uh, authors, uh, painters, musicians, composers, have too much to worry about because um, machines are not conscious beings. They're not, never going to fall in love or lose a loved one. They're not going to understand those experiences, those uniquely human experiences. And so um, the arts that they may make are going to be very poor compared to the art that, that uh, humans make that talk about those experiences because we can relate to, to each other. Um, and so whilst machines might make good pastiches of the art that we have today, that, and that may entertain us at the surface level, I don't think they're ever, going to, uh, they're ever going to speak to us in the way that great art has spoken to us in the past. Thank you.
Thank you very much. That was an exciting ex discussion. Uh, my question comes from two earlier discussions and earlier books. One of the earliest books was In the Absence of the Sacred by Jerry Mander, which was about technology. And the other one was where IQ is being used as a discriminator, which is Biology as Politics by Somnath Zutshi, these two. So we've come a long way from there in terms of technology, but I think the question still remains about sacred, as in gerrymanders, and politics. So could I ask how AI today, the way we are, and all these things that you have said today, how does AI fit into these two things, sacred and politics? Sacred, I don't mean religiosity, I really understand. Sacred is that values that you were just talking about. And politics, where it is about a lot of regulation, not regulation, discrimination, and engaging. So AI as sacred, AI as politics. Thank you. Thank you. We can just maybe have a round each and any further closing remarks you might have, given that the clock is, alas, ticking. Well, uh, those are great questions, and we don't have time to give them justice, but um, we do uh, idolize technology too much. Um, we forget at the end of the day it's just a tool, a tool that lets us change society, um, and hopefully we choose good ways that is going to make society better, more equitable for people. But um, that requires us to make better choices. Um, and indeed, I don't think we're, we're asking the right questions today uh, or, or demanding enough of our politicians about, about how we are letting that technology into our lives. And there are places where technology, AI, may make better decisions than humans, um, places like the judiciary or on the battlefield, where even if they'd make those better decisions, I think we give up an essential part of our humanity if we hand those decisions to machines and not leave them with, with humans. Avinash? Well, uh, you know, uh, see, nothing, you can never leave the human emotion for granted. You know, that will always play a role what Tony also just said. Having said that, what is most important for us to understand that technology is only enabling us to do our job better, solve our life's problem. We are talking so much about AI today because it's just eight or nine year old technology, not more than that, in the public space. And we are still, we are still discovering as to what all possibility that it can give you. I think let's settle down for a time. The, it's, its misuse has already happened in social media and in the warfare. It's good use, we are yet to realize as to how it can improve every human lives on this earth for better. Um, th thanks for that question, uh, ma'am. I think that, uh, as I mentioned earlier, for me, you know, and one of the things I've tried to do in my book is ac exactly that, that I believe that a lot of our conversations around technology, and this I say coming from the field of technology myself, uh, is too unidimensionally focused on one or two aspects. So in India, for example, from a startup, standpoint, I can tell you we talk only about the number of unicorns, and that's a problem, right? We should not be doing that. From a political or economic standpoint, we talk only from the standpoint of whether it will uh, make us lose jobs or help us gain jobs. And I think that these kind of unidimensional views of technology are a problem. We must have a much broader framework, all of us. I think as Toby said in the beginning, this is affecting all our lives. Right? It's like looking at colonialism and being like, oh, that's not going to affect us. No. Similarly, as colonialism, industrialization, tech is shaping our lives economically, geopolitically, societally, in terms of our values, our relationships, and hence a broad framework that looks at how is tech shaping our economic opportunity? How is tech shaping our society, cell structures, values, etc.? How is this particular technology creating new economic opportunity? How is it creating a new set of political elites? or politically more powerful people. I think all of these questions must be asked every time we are evaluating a technology and not either be too scared or too optimistic about technology. So um, we're banged out of time. I cannot thank you enough for being such a fabulous audience and to all of you uh, for the time here. I hope there are many more discussions about this in coming JLFs. Thank you. For all we know, we could have a session a few years later where there's four chat GPT empowered panelists and an announcer as well. <laughs> Who knows? Uh, we would like to thank Toby Walsh, Avinash Pandey, Anirudh Suri, and Praveen Swami.
for that beautiful conversation. Toby Walsh and Anil Suri will be signing their books right here, so you can make a cue. There's already some forming up, um, and we'll see you at the next session in a bit. Thank you. The second point. There it is.